The subtraction of matrix, just remember they have to be the same dimension and then you just do it in a, a scalar calculation element by element and then you'll get the resulting matrix. Okay, and sorry these notes aren't posted but they will be. All right, so now I'm going to get into a little notation because this is very common. So first of all, I'm going to show you the result. Let's say I want to get a matrix B, okay? The matrix B is a scalar times a matrix A. So here's an example. Here's the matrix A. Okay, I'm going to multiply that by a scalar, 3. Question is, how do I do that or how's that operation defined? If you have this, you just multiply every element of the matrix by the scalar K to get the answer, right? So I get this, but 3 times 2 is 6. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times minus 1 is minus 3 and so on. Okay? That's, that's easy enough. All right. So the, the problem with this approach, of course, is if, if, you, if somebody asked you, how do you multiply a matrix times a scalar, it's not ideal to give them a, an example as the only definition. You're like, here's how you do it. And they go, what if it's a different problem? You're like, you do it kind of the same way. You know? so, so this is a general, and this, this also introduces notation that we use, and you'll see a lot in applied mathematics, so I thought I would introduce it now. Okay, so let me, let's say I want to define this operation, but not by an example. I want to define this operation for any matrix A and any scalar K, okay? So first of all, I'm going to tell you what the dimensions of these things are. So when I, do you know what this symbol means? Yeah, it means it's an element of. So it's saying K is an element of R. It means K is a real number, right? So why do I do that? Because it's a lot easier than writing K is a real number, right? So that's what it means. <coughs> This means A is a matrix of real numbers. It has M columns and N rows. Okay? Again, it's a shorthand notation. It beats having to, to write out what I just said. And by definition, B has to have the same dimension as A. So it'll also have M rows and N columns. It'll also be real numbers. Okay? So now I have to tell you how I get the matrix B. All I've done here is tell you its dimension. So I'm telling you, if you want to know what a particular element of the matrix B is, I, J, where I is the row, J is the column, then take the element, take the scalar K and multiply the corresponding element in the matrix A to get the element B, right? So this says if you want the one, two element of B, one, two would be this guy here of B, then you have to take that number K and multiply it times the one, two element of A, which is that, that gives you nine, okay? So that tells me how I find all the elements of B and all this thing says is now that you have every element of B for every possible combination of I and J that makes sense, then just put them in a matrix. That's what this says. B is just a matrix comprised of all those elements, okay? You might say, wow, God, that's onerous. <laughs> I prefer this definition. Okay, that's not a definition, that's an example, okay? Um, so this is just a, so the, the thing that you'll see me use a lot here are these kind of things up here especially. It's very important when you do matrix algebra to try to keep track of how many rows and columns things have. And you'll see when you, remember when you do MATLAB and you look up in the upper right hand corner, it tells you what the variable is and it tells you what the dimension is, how many rows and columns, okay? Because this will determine certain operations whether you can perform them or not. And in particular, let's say we want to do this thing which is done a lot, multiply two matrices. So I have a matrix A and a matrix B and I want to multiply them to get a matrix C, okay? <coughs> so I have to define this operation, but for now I'm telling you the following. This is only going to be defined if the number of columns of A is the same as the number of rows of B, okay? And you might say, well, that's really weird, but when you see the, when you see the definition, it'll make sense to you. So that, that's why I'm saying you can't just take an arbitrary matrix A and multiply times an arbitrary matrix B because they won't have the right dimensions and you can't do it. If you try to do it in MATLAB, MATLAB just gives you an error message. It says the, ma the dimensions are not consistent of the two matrices you're trying to multiply. Okay? So, number of columns of A has to be equal to the number of rows of B. Why is that? Well, here's an e let me go through two examples, then I'll go through the definition. Here's maybe the simplest example. So this is actually two vectors, it's, you know. A vector is a simple case of a matrix, right? That's a matrix with a single row and that's a matrix with a single column. Think of it that way. So let's say I want to multiply these two together. First of all, can I do it? Well, is the number of rows of A the same as the number of columns of B? Yep, they're both one. One row, one column, okay? 
So I guess I should have written this out in a little more detail, but um, so let me just write out this example here. So if I want to multiply that thing, uh, oh, I can look right here. So is it 1, 3, and 2? That figures. And 4, 1, and 2. All right. OK, to do this, what I'm going to do is multiply that times that. So I'm multiplying 1 times 4. You get the idea of the first element of this times the first element of that. Then I'm going to add that three second elements multiplied together. 2 times 1. And then what I'm going to get minus 2 times 2. And if I'm very smart here, I'll see that's 2. Or did I make a mistake here? <laughs> it's an impressive set of calculations I performed. What did I do wrong here? Oh, that's a 3, right? OK, so that makes the answer 3. OK? So the reason I didn't write out the detailed calculation is because it's all part. If you follow the definition, you'll see what it is. But OK? All right, so that's two vectors multiplied together. You understand this is a row times a column. You can't take a column vector and multiply it times a row vector. Like if I were to switch these two around and try to have this on the left-hand side and this on the right-hand side, dimensions don't make any sense to do that. It's not defined, OK? All right, so what about this matrix uh, problem here? OK, so let's say I want to multiply this thing times this thing. So first of all, you have to determine, is it possible to do it? To do this, I have to have the, um, this guy has to have the same number of columns, one, two, three, as, right? La, la, la. Same number of columns. In fact, I screwed this one up down here. I'm sorry. This guy had to have the same number of columns, one, two, three, as rows of B, one, two, three. Okay. So here, if we look, there's one, two, three columns, and there's one, two, three rows. So you can do it. Okay. So how do you do it? Okay. Well, if you look at the definition here, first thing I told you is what the dimensions are. So I'm assuming A is a matrix of real numbers with M rows and N columns. Okay. Then I'm assuming B here is also a matrix of real numbers. It has to have N rows because this has N columns. Only that is allowed. And it's got some arbitrary number of, of uh, columns R. The resulting matrix is going to have the same number of rows as A and the same number of columns as B. You see that that's M there and R there. Okay. So if I use that definition, what should I expect here? Well, this thing has two rows and this thing has three columns. So I should expect the resulting matrix C to have two rows and three columns, number one. Okay. All right, so how did I get this element eight here? I took this row times that column. Okay. So you get the one, one element here by taking this row times this column. If you do that, that looks like eight, right? 1 times 2 minus that's 0, so 6, 2 plus 6 is 8. How did I get that minus 4? I took that row times that column. I got the minus 8 by taking that row times that column, okay, and that gave me the whole first row. To get the second row, I did the same thing except I used the second row instead of the first row. So that number 0 there is that row times that column, right? You get minus 2 plus 2, 0, okay? All right. And in a, in a circuitous way that you may not completely understand unless you love indexing, that's what this says up here, okay? It says if you want to know, if you have a matrix A and B that are the appropriate dimension, then you'll get a, a consistent dimension with C. And the way you figure out the elements of C is like this. So what this thing here says is, is that basically, you multi if you want to know, um, <coughs> So the indexing here is what causes problems, right? Because there's, there's lots of it. There's like J, and there's I, and there's K, and then there's M, and there's R. <laughs> so you're like, holy, OK. Um, anyway, so to, it says, for example, if you want to figure out the 1, 1 element, let's just say, let's just say J is 1 and K is 1. That means you want to figure out that element right there. Okay. Then what you're going to do is take all the elements in the first row of J and multiply them times the corresponding elements in the first column of B. And that'll give you the 1, 1 element of C. 
Okay, so this is just a general definition, applies to any number of columns, any number of rows, and so on and so forth, okay? But I have to admit, practically speaking, if you can understand how I especially did this problem, you'll be able to multiply any matrices you want, okay? Obviously, this becomes increasingly not fun if these matrices get large. Like if I were to give, you know, a 100 by 100 matrix times a 100 by 100 matrix, you would not like me. Of course, in, you could do it in MATLAB quickly. Oh, and this is critically important. You remember, now I, I never know when kids learn math, but I swear you learn like commutative associative properties when you're in like third grade. Is that accurate? See? Because I told my, my kids that don't seem to know this, I'm like, what's wrong with you guys these days? But anyway, um, so this, for this operation, this does not commute. The, the, the operation of matrix multiplication is non-commutative, meaning A times B is not the same as B times A, even if they're both defined. Right, so if A and B are both square matrices, you could multiply A times B or B times A. E either one is allowed. They're, it's defined. Okay. So even if this, both operations are defined, they will not be equal to each other. So it's critical, like when you multiply scalars, you never worry about if 3 is on the left or 3 is on the right. It doesn't make any difference, right? But when you multiply matrices, it's critical that you keep track of whether A is at the, in front of B or behind B. Otherwise, you get the wrong answer, or you often get things you can't do because the dimensions don't make sense. But it's critical you do this, and you'll see when this comes up, okay? So it's un this is unlike scalar algebra, right? Scalar algebra doesn't have this. Everything commutes. Yeah? So then for our last, we can switch those around and get a, an actual answer, but it's different from what we have. For the, for the problems I've given you, you can't because the dimensions don't make sense. So, like, for example, if that's A and that's B, you can't do, B times A is not even defined for that problem, or for that problem, for that matter, I think, right? No, I mean, well, for the first one, yeah, for the second one, a 3 by 1 and 1 by 3, if you switch them around, you can still multiply just different answers. No, this one definitely cannot be multiplied if they're switched around. So if I had 4, 1, and 2, and then over here I had 1, 3, and minus 2, remember, you, you have, this has to be true. Columns of A has to be the same as the, as the rows of B, okay? So the reason this is allowed, because this has three columns and this has three rows. But if you switch them around, this thing has one column and this guy has, let's just write it out. Is this what it is? 4, 1, 2, 1, 3, minus 2. Okay. Okay. So maybe that, huh, fascinating. All right, because this does have one column and this does have one row. So I get it would be like this. It'd be, it would now be a three by three matrix. The first element would be four times one. Second element would be four, it'd be 12 uh, minus eight. In other words, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, I'm, just, I'm just taking it to its logical conclusion here. Okay, so you're right, and, and I think you'll all agree that's not the same as that. Okay, that's a scalar, that's a matrix, okay. And so this one, since we're obsessing over this, has three columns. So this guy has three columns, but this thing only has two rows, you see, so it wouldn't even work the other way around. Yeah, so you're right. Okay, so you gotta remember this, as you do um, matrix algebra, order of the matrices and vectors is critical, when you get the wrong answer. Okay. So I guess we're going back to the example that I started at the beginning of class. So all I've done here is rewrite the equations. There's nothing new here, just rewriting them so we get it on the same page. That's what I ended one slide with. Those were the balances we got on the six components in that reaction network that I gave you. And so now I'd like to write these as a big matrix, okay? So, I mean, you could argue that our primary interest in dealing with, uh, well, our primary interest in dealing with linear algebra is twofold. One is how do you solve linear algebraic equations like those? And as you're going to see in the last third of the class, we're also going to use these ideas to solve linear differential equations. Okay. Where are you guys in differential equations right now? What are you doing? Second order linear differential equations. Okay. All right. So it should mesh well. Using Kreisig's book also, right? Chapter one and two. Yeah, good, all right. 
OK, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take these six scalar equations and write them as a big matrix problem. OK, so let's see if you can follow this. I'm sure you can. So I'm going to write this as AV equals B. OK, so I'm going to put in this vector B all the V's that I think I know that are going to be known. In reality, they'll have to be measured. But let's just say I know VI and VO. OK? So in other words, I'm taking this first equation and I'm, rewri I'm, putting, I'm rewriting as V1 equals VI, let's say. All right. So, so I, my claim is the first equation, that equation right there is, is the first row here. Right? Because if I take this first row and multiply it times this column, I'll get just V1, right? And that, it'll equal what's on the right hand. So that says V1 equals VI. That's that equation right there. Okay. What if I do the second equation? I get 2 times V1 minus V2. I get these two are 0, then minus V6. Okay. And I get that equals 0. And that's the second equation. And so finally, if you wanted to come down to like the last equation, you get minus 2v1, you get 0 times that, 2 times v3, 0 times that, minus v5, 0 times that, that equals 0. That's the last equation. Okay? So the reason this is so nice is this is a, this is a much more, I don't know if it's more compact, but it's so much easier to work with. And all the methods that we talk about <coughs> for solving these equations require you write the problem like this. Okay. So for our problem, this is the matrix of interest. This is the vector you'd like to calculate. And these are, all, these are things that we claim to know. We either know they're zero or we know their values, vi and v0. Okay? All right, so this was just meant to be an example of what a, matri what a matrix might look like. All right. Well, this is really boring. <laughs> But good, it saves us time. So all I've done, all I've done in this slide is do what I just told you, right? <clears throat> I wrote out the same matrix I put together. I claim these are all the unknowns. These are things that are measured. And if I multiply these things out, I get the equations back, right? So all I've done is taken all the equations, put them in a matrix like this, and then I multiplied the matrix out and got the equations back. I mean, this is just an example. Obviously, you would never do this. You'd stop when you put the matrix together. You'd be confident that if you multiplied it out, you get the answer because you put it together correctly. Okay. But all I'm saying here is if I multiply like the first row times the first column, that equals VI, that's that, and so on and so forth. So it's just what I said verbally. Okay, I forgot I had it, sorry. All right. So here's some operations on matrices that we're going to use a lot. There's something called the transpose of a matrix. Okay. <laughs> So let's say I've got a matrix A and I want to do something to the matrix A called transpose it. Okay. So what I'm going to do basically is I'm, let's take this example, let's say I have this matrix. It just means what was the first column becomes the first row. What becomes the second column becomes the second row. So I switch rows and columns. That's called the transpose. Okay. If the matrix A has M columns, sorry, M rows and N columns, then the matrix B here will have N rows and M columns, right? The number of columns and rows will switch. And all this says is just, if you want to make the matrix B, just make, just switch the elements, which is what I did. Okay? So if you understand that, no problem. So here's some properties. We don't prove them, but I'm just going to tell you they're true. Some of them are obvious and some aren't. The first two are obvious, the last one's not, I don't think. So if you have two matrices A plus B obviously have to be the same dimension or you can't add them. You want to take the transpose of those two things added together. That's the same as A transpose plus B transpose. Okay. Why would you care? Because you might get something like this and it simplifies your problem to write it like this instead of the original form. Let's say you have a scalar C times a matrix A and you want to transpose that. That's the same as C times A transpose. Those, those are pretty obvious, I think. Here's one that's not obvious, at least to me. Or I should say, at least to you, it's obvious to me because <laughs> I've seen it a lot. But if you have a matrix A times a matrix B, obviously A and B, you have to be able to multiply them together for this to make sense. You want to take the transpose of that? That's the same as B transpose times A transpose. Okay. And if A and B are allowed to be multiplied, then B transpose and A transpose by definition can be multiplied. Because right, this has to have the same number of columns as rows here. 
and so this is the number of rows here, and you know, it, you switch, it all works out. So this, this thing is actually pretty useful sometimes and not obvious. Okay, so that's operations called the transpose. Um, you see these things a lot in applied mathematics. If someone says there's a linear form, they write it like this, okay? So you have a, you have a vector called C. It's a vector of constants. It's n-dimensional, C1, C2, Cn. There's some numbers, okay? They're real numbers. In this class, we try to write things that are, if I write a vector, by definition, it's a column vector, and if I want it to be a row vector, I transpose it, right? Because if you take a column vector and you transpose it, it becomes a row vector, okay? So because I want this to be a row vector, I explicitly say it's, it's transpose, because C normally would be a column vector. So C transpose is the row vector. You multiply that times the vector x. Typically, x's are unknown, c's are some known constants. You get something that looks like this, right? It's, you get c1 times, this is just two vectors multiplied together. It looks just like that example right there, okay? Except here is a set of unknowns and we call these c's. If you do it, you know, you get c1 times x1, c2 times x2, so on and so forth. So this is, a, this is linear, right? It's called a linear form because it's a linear expression in terms of the unknown's x's, okay? It's just a lot more, so, if so you understand how much more convenient it is to write that than this? Like let's say this was 10 dimensional. You could write, you know, 10 of these terms added together, you could just write this thing. And this applies to any dimension C and X you want as long as they're consistent with each other. So it's just much more efficient. If someone says quadratic form, they mean, they typically write this like this. X transpose times some matrix D times, some, times a vector X again. All right. So again, if we want something to be a row vector, we write it as transpose, so that's x transpose there. There's x over there, and in the middle there's d. I call this matrix d because this is a particular matrix we we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, I guess, in more detail. This is a diagonal matrix. In other words, all the elements of this matrix are zero except things along the diagonal, okay? So this is a very particular kind of matrix, diagonal matrix. And so now if we want to perform this multiplication, so when you have um, a situation like this, you have your choice. You can either multiply this row times this matrix and get something, and then when you're done with that, you can multiply that times that column, or you could multiply that matrix times that column, and when you're done, then you have to multiply still with this row. So you can do them in any order you want. But you can see in this order, what I've chose to do is I've chosen to multiply this row times the matrix, and my claim is that I get this, okay, when I multiply that times that. It's not hard to see. So, right, we know how to multiply things. If we want to know what the first element of this, first of all, this resulting thing I'm going to get is going to be another row vector, right? Because we say when we multiply things, we get the dimension. If we multiply two, you can think of this as a matrix with a single row, right? That's what this is. So we know when we multiply these things together, we're going to get the same number of rows as this thing and the columns of this thing. So that means we're going to get one row and n columns. That's what this thing has. If you want to know what the first element of that matrix is, you take that row and multiply times that column. That D1 just multiplies X1, everything else is zero. You multiply this row times that, you'll get D2X2, right? And finally, when you do the final one, you'll get Dn times Xn. So, it's, a, it's, just a, it's just a way of, of getting a linear form like that, but then we still have to multiply this x1 over here. I mean, sorry, this vector here. And obviously, if you multiply something like a row vector times a column vector, which we've done several times, you just get a scalar now, a scalar. And so the first term is going to be d1, x1 times x1, that's x1, d1, x1 squared. That'll be d2x2 squared until you get down here to dn xn squared. So in other words, if you see a term like this, that, that gives you a scalar that's linear in x, where x is a vector, right? It's linear in the components of x. And if you see something like this, you're going to get a scalar that's quadratic in the elements of x, like that, okay? This becomes convenient later, you'll see. Again, it's a lot of machinery we're just introducing at this point. Okay, so here's some common matrices. If someone tells you, you they have a symmetric matrix, that's a matrix where A transpose equals A. Okay, obviously A has to be square for this to make any sense. So if I have a symmetric matrix, it, the, A and A transpose are the same thing. You might, so, 
I guess I didn't feel like giving you an example of this, but. There's a symmetric matrix, right? Because if you take the transpose of this, wait a minute. What is it? So if this is A, I'm not so, I'm not so sure now. So I've got to switch the rows and the columns. So the first row, yeah, okay. So first row becomes the first, the first column becomes the first row of that one. So that's that. So that became that. And then this thing becomes that. It's the same. Okay, it's called symmetric. You can see it's, if you just look along the diagonal, what you need for a matrix to be um, Symmetric is you need the elements above the diagonal to be equal to each other, identical to each other. Symmetric about the diagonal, that's why they call it symmetric, okay? Um, if something skew symmetric, it's the same, except instead of A transpose equaling A, A transpose equals minus A. I'm not even gonna try to give you one of those. We don't use that so much, so. If something's diagonal, which I already showed you, it looks like this. The only non-zero elements are along the diagonal of the matrix. Everything else has to be zero. If a, a diagonal matrix can have zeros along the diagonal, the keyest thing can't have anything but zeros off the diagonal. Everyone knows what I mean by the diagonal, right? It's that right there. I wish it, okay? That's very common. These types of matrices are extremely useful, triangular matrices. So if I tell you something's upper triangular, that means the only non-zero elements are above the diagonal, okay? So the diagonal, we draw it here. That means only the things above the diagonal can be non-zero. Everything below the diagonal has to be zero. We call it upper triangular, okay? On the other hand, if everything if is zero above the diagonal, you call that lower triangular. That's like this example, okay? These have to be square to make any sense. All right. Um, if someone says they've got a positive definite matrix, they've got a very special matrix that satisfies the following properties. So if you have a matrix A and you multiply on the right by X, oh sorry, that's the left by X transpose, and you multiply it on the right by X, okay? The first thing is, and A is a square matrix, that any square matrix, well, let's just say it is a square matrix. First of all, do you understand this will be a scalar? If you take X transpose times A times X, it'll be a scalar. Just sorry to do this to you. It's the scalar the same reason this thing was a scalar. It'll be maybe a lot more complicated because there's not so many zeros, but it'll still end up being just a scalar, just like this one was. All right. So first of all, you have to appreciate this will be a scalar. And then my claim is, or just, it's just really a definition, that if A is a positive definite matrix, then the scalar that you get by performing this multiplication will always be greater than or equal to zero, or always greater than zero, actually, for any vector x that's not zero. So it's a pretty special matrix, right? I can give you any matrix x in the world, as long as it's not all zeros, and no matter what it is, if you perform this operation, you'll get something greater than zero. If you have a matrix like that, it's called a positive definite matrix, okay? And then everyone's favorite matrix, the old identity matrix, okay? The identity matrix is the matrix equivalent of the number one, okay? So it's just a matrix, it's a, it's a diagonal matrix, it's square, and along the diagonal are nothing but ones. That's the identity matrix. And it has the same role in matrix algebra that one does in scalar algebra. So for example, I'll prove this to you if you don't believe me, but I think it's pretty easy to see. If I have a matrix A and I multiply by the identity matrix, I just get the matrix A back. And it doesn't matter if I multiply on the right-hand side or the left-hand side, because remember I told you it matters, generally speaking. But I can multiply by A on the left-hand side or A on the <laughs> right-hand side or left-hand side. So for example, if you had a matrix like So you have that's your matrix A, and over here is your identity matrix. So they're both two by two matrices. You multiply this thing out. How do you do this? Well, to get the first element, you multiply that row times that column. That gives you two. To get the second element, you multiply that row times that column. That gives you one. To get the, this element here, this row times that column, three. Finally, to get the last element, this, this row times that column, that gives you four. That's the matrix A again, okay? 
And this works for any dimension, it doesn't matter. It has to be, it has to be square. Identity matrix has to be square. So this is very useful uh, for reasons we'll be using this, in fact, in our next lecture a lot. Okay. So you can multiply on the right, you can multiply on the left, it makes no difference, you get A back. So it's scalar, I mean, matrix equivalent of one. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about something called linear um, dependence and independence of vectors. This is kind of a definition for reasons, I'll explain to you why it's useful in a second. Okay, so this, the book uses this notation, I don't love it, but I went ahead and followed it. Um, so we have M vectors, so each one of these is a vector. You see, the subscript here, parenthesis one tells you which vector you're talking about. That's the first vector A, that's the second vector A. It's not telling you anything about the dimension or index. It's not telling you an element of A. It's just differentiating the different vectors from each other. First vector, second vector, third, all the way up to M. Okay? And these vectors all have equal dimension. Like they all have five elements, they all have ten elements, whatever. Doesn't matter what the dimension is, but they all have to be the same. Okay. Let's say you form this equation. So you multiply the first vector times a constant, add that to the second vector times a constant, and keep doing that till you get the last vector times a constant. And you want to know when this equals zero. Okay? So if the vectors are so-called linearly independent of each other, then the only way to satisfy this equation for the, is for, is for the, all the c's to be zero. Okay? So you can see that's obviously one solution, right? If someone said, when will this be zero, an obvious solution is all the c's are zero, that'll do the job. They'll do it for any a as you want. But if that's the only solution, the vector is called linearly independent. Okay? What does that mean? It means in some sense, and this is not very precise, each vector is unique. In other words, you can't get one vector as a linear combination of the other vectors. They're unique from each other. In the world of equations, that means each vector represents like a unique equation, okay? I mean, you understand that if you're solving equations, it's kind of like the example I gave you earlier. You remember I said, there's my equations. I'm not including, whoops, sorry. There's my equations here. I have six of them. I'm not including these other two because they're redundant, right? They're, they're de linearly dependent on the equations I already have. They have no new information, so I'm, I'm just excluding them. So this is a generalization of this idea right here. Okay, linear independent. So if I form this equation, the only possible solution is all those c's equal zero. That's what cj means. It just means all the c's. Then each vector is unique, and the vectors are called linearly independent of each other. If, on the other hand, there is some constant C that make this thing zero, that the C's are not zero. In other words, I can pick C1, 2, and C2, you know, C2, 2, and C3 minus 3, and then it equals zero. Then those vectors are not linearly independent. They're called linearly dependent. That means at least one of those vectors is somehow redundant with the other ones. I'll give you an example in a minute. Okay. This is very important because it's going to end up telling us if we have a set of equations whether we're going to be able to solve them or not. Because you understand if you have six equations and six unknowns, that's like a necessary condition to solve the problem, but it's not sufficient. Because if those equations are redundant, then you might actually only have five equations. You get the idea? And if you only have five equations, you can't find six unknowns from them. Okay. And the problem is that if you've got um, 